right. Welcome, everybody. My name is Christy Foster. I'm head of engagement at Conservation Careers. I'm really excited to welcome you to today's webinar and this month's webinar. And our topic is, as you know, confidence and imposter syndrome. Um, I'm here today with All Dean right. Coomer. Welcome, everybody. My who name is I'm going to introduce Foster. in a moment. I'm Sorry for the conservation career feedback there. We'll get rid of that. Um, so we're going to get Dean to, to introduce himself in a moment. But I think this topic is exciting because as conservationists, we spend a lot of time getting training, building up our knowledge, building up our skills, spending time looking for jobs, applying for jobs, doing interviews, all of that important stuff. And we spend almost no time thinking about, you know, the one thing that's kind of core to all of it, which is what's going on in our, in our own minds and what determines our, our confidence and our success and our happiness. So today we're going to get some really valuable insight into our own minds um, and, and how you can use that in your career to, to benefit yourself and do more good through your career. So thanks everyone for being here. Uh, it would be great if you could just, if you'd like to, type your name and your location into the chat. Let us know where you're calling in from. Looks like we've got about 75 people here on Zoom and we've got some people joining via YouTube also. Um, so you guys might not know that we now support a network of about 630,000 conservationists each year from around the world, about 178 countries. Um, and this topic of confidence and, and also imposter syndrome come up almost as often, if not more often than things like how to apply for jobs, where to get training, all of that stuff. So it's, it's obviously a really, a really common theme in the conservation sector. Um, great, okay. Well, thanks everyone. <laughs> great. Okay. It's great to hey. see so many names and so many great. places. <laughs> yeah. Netherlands, Scotland, Switzerland, Ireland, Belgium, Portugal, a whole range. That's fantastic. Sweden, Hawaii, uh, Spain, South Africa, Germany, Florida. Wonderful. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining together. We're thrilled to have you here. It's going to be an exciting talk. Um, so we're going to cover what's confidence, what's imposter syndrome, what do they look like in practice? Uh, we're going to talk about what's happening in, well, I should say, Dean's going to talk about what's happening in your mind um, that, that can produce some challenges around confidence. And then lastly, we're going to look at, you know, how, how can you better manage this um, so you can, you can be your best self and be the way you want to be. So to do this, we have a very special guest. His name's Dean Coomer. He's a psychological skills mentor with Chimp Management. And chimp management basically helps people from, from all walks of, of life um, and all different types of careers to get the best out of themselves and, and out of others using this model that's called the chimp model. Um, and it, it basically takes neuroscience and it presents it in a, a really sort of fun um, and accessible and, and easy to understand way so that we can all learn to use our minds and manage our minds better. Um, so Dean is a, he's a member of the British Psychological Society. He's got a master's degree in psychology and I, I believe also quite a long military career prior to all of that. So just a, a wealth of experience across different sectors. So Dean, I'd, I'd love it if you could just tell us a little bit more about yourself and, and also about chimp management. Yeah, thanks, Christy. Um, I mean, I think the first thing I want to say is thank you very much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure and a privilege to be here. And I'm not just saying that just to massage everyone's egos and make their make their chimps feel uh, feel welcome. I think it's because it's a real privilege to work with individuals and coach and mentor and help train them and help them achieve their goals. But I think there's something bigger here. You know, when when we're we're talking about conservation people's goals are generally above themselves. There's something else going on. And I think if I can be a, a very small part of that, then like I say, it's a real privilege and a pleasure. Um, yeah, my name's Dean Coomer. I've been working for Professor Steve Peters uh, at Chimp Management for the last six years. Uh, we're an eclectic bunch of doctors, psychologists, psychiatrists, trainers, uh, teachers, etc. 
And basically, uh, we're trying to help people manage their minds to get the best out of themselves, whatever that means to them. So we know some people, particularly over the last year or so, have been struggling. So getting the best out of them might mean just putting one foot in front of the other and leaving the house in the morning and getting through the day. And getting the best out of yourself for others might be you know, you want to go for a promotion, you want to take a certain project on, you really want to leap forward in life. So, uh, so that's our raison d'etre. Um, and when I talk about managing the mind, the mind is a very complicated concept. Um, essentially, to make it simple, I'm talking about the thoughts, the feelings, the beliefs, the expectations that we have, and how they affect our behaviours. Okay. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Dean. We're thrilled no to have you here. It's going to be a really exciting talk. So I guess it, let's dive in. Um, and we're going to spend about the next, I would say, 30 minutes, give or take, um, just having a discussion. And, and then after that, we're going to open it up like we normally do to questions from, from those of you who are joining here on Zoom. Um, so you can type your questions into the Q&A box. Um, you know, if you think of something while we're talking, you can go ahead and type it in there. Um, and that should allow everyone to, to upvote questions. So we answer the ones that are most, most relevant. Um, so let's just start off with kind of a, Dean and I have prepared, you know, like a few questions at the beginning, just to get thinking about these topics. Um, so I'll, Dean, I'm, I'm going to pass to you to introduce this and I'm going to launch a little a poll here so that you guys can can answer live but anonymously. Yeah, I think I mean, you know, to try and get to know some of you, I know it's going to be very difficult, but I always like to start these things with a little bit of a game. So it's a bit of interaction. And I don't know if you've ever played this game before. And I know there are lots of different nationalities. You may never have heard of this game. Uh, some of you might have even played it last night with the gin and tonic. I don't know. I'm not here to judge. Um, but the game is called Have You Ever? So as the uh, the options appear on the screen, um, you just have to, you know, amend have you ever. So I think you can see them now. So as you look through, you can just tick them. Have you ever bungee jumped? And what sort of thoughts and feelings come back if you have? Have you ever written poetry? Have you ever cried during a Disney? Other, other films are available, Pixar, et cetera, but have you ever cried during a Disney film? Have you ever spilled a drink over someone by accident? It happens, doesn't it? You know, a bit clumsy every now and again. But what about, and this is where I'll have to be careful of your questions. Uh, have you ever poured a drink over someone on purpose? And what about, have you ever burped or belched the letters of the alphabet? Now that might just be ABC after you've had a, a fizzy drink. It's not the whole alphabet. That would be a record. Um, but just amend, just, you know, write in, tick in if you've ever done any of those. So that's the first, that's the first set of questions. Brilliant. Okay. Dean, do you, is it okay if I show the results to that first one oh, now? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. So I, we've had about, about 90%, no, about 95% of people voted. So, so that's good. And I'll share the results with everybody. Looks like cried during a Disney film came out just barely on oh, top. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that is, and yeah, spilled a drink over someone by accident. But I think you can see there, I mean, if we were to, you know, if you were to give yourself a point for each one, as it works out there, you probably get about, you know, three out of six of those, which is quite common. But what about this next uh, part? So it's still the same, have you ever, but take a look at these questions. So have you ever, said yes when you didn't want to? Have you ever beat yourself up for making a mistake? Even a simple mistake. Have you ever heard yourself say, oh, you idiot, why did you do that? Have you ever felt insecure? Have you ever felt like a failure? Have you ever felt like a fraud? And have you ever felt underconfident? So tick all of those. Just seeing a few messages here. Sorry, guys, it looks like it, you might be only be able to select one option. Let me, let's try a slightly different poll then. 
um, if you if it's limiting you. And that might be technology. how I set it up, but we have a backup. Um, so if you count up, maybe just the answer is how many times you said yes there. Yeah, we'll if, us, you think about, we'll yeah if, if, if you think about those questions, I mean, even now you don't have to press a button, just give yourself a point and you can actually like tick them down. So have you ever said yes when you didn't want to? Have you ever beat yourself up for making a mistake? Give yourself another point. Have you ever felt insecure? Give yourself another point, even a little bit insecure. Have you ever felt like a failure, felt like a fraud or felt underconfident? And then top them up and just see what your score is there. So the average for the first section is generally three out of six. So I don't know if we'll be able to see everyone's results yeah. on this one, but they'll be able to have their own. I had about 90% of people voted on that last one. So I'll share the results now. Yeah. Thanks guys for filling that out. So, and I think because they might not have come through, what's, you know, when we look at these results, generally it's six out of six, <laughs> for, or at least five and a half out of six, the way averages work. So all of those people have experienced them at some point. So what does that tell us? And that basically tells us that, well, these things are quite normal. It's normal to feel underconfident. It's normal to feel anxious or insecure or feel like a fraud from time to time. And I'm not here to judge and say it's good, it's bad, it's right, it's wrong, it's positive, negative. What I'm here to do is ask you, the people who are watching and listening, well, is that helpful for you? And what do you want to do about it? And if we were to sit down one-to-one -one and I was to ask you, well, you know, do you want to feel like a failure? Do you want to feel underconfident? Then I'm sure the answer would be no. <laughs> and otherwise you wouldn't be here. So straight away, we can identify that there's a problem. Well, if you don't want to be like that, what's going on? And the problem is that the mind is divided and very often in conflict. And I'll quantify that as we go through the, uh, the rest of the, the questions, et cetera. But I just want you to hold on to that thought. Why do we do, why do we feel, why do we think the things we do when we really don't want to? Well, the mind's divided and very often in conflict. It's not you. And that might sound a bit strange, but it's not you. Thanks so much, Dean. Um, just, just for everyone in the, the audience, we'll try and keep questions until the end. Feel free to type into the chat anytime if you have a comment, but um, we'll try and hold questions to the end. And I think that's probably piqued everyone's curiosity now. How is the mind divided and why are we doing these things that we don't want to do and why isn't it us doing, doing them? Um, so we're going to delve into to that in a second. And, and first, I, I just wanted to sort of start with setting the scene, you know, like, what what is confidence because this is one of these terms that we talk about a lot and we use a lot but but what does that actually mean for confidence well again it's interesting because you know if you were to type in what is confidence into you know google or other search engines right now you'll come up with millions of definitions and it's generally around our belief in our ability to do something you know, that's that's the general definition. So what we believe we're capable of and what the way we approach confidence in chimp management is we say it's a choice. So and that might sound a bit strange to begin with, but it is actually a choice based on what part of the mind you're using at that particular time. And self-confidence is very often mixed up with other terms that other people may have heard about self-esteem, self-image, self-worth, self-efficacy, mastery. All of those tend to encompass and are intimately related to self-confidence, because when we look at self-confidence and imposter syndrome, they've got a very high comorbidity. So they're very closely related to lots of other conditions such as anxiety, low self-esteem, uh, burnout, physical exhaustion, rumination, etc. So there's lots of interrelatedness between these things. But confidence as well, belief in our ability to achieve something. But I want you to think differently about it tonight. I want you to think it as a choice. And again, I'll quantify that as we go through uh, the next few minutes.
Excellent. Okay, well, let's come back then. I, I, I want to just dive into this, this idea now that the mind is divided. And I've, I've been reading the book, The Chimp Paradox, sort of as part of my preparation and research for this webinar, and, and just out of interest. Um, and it's been fascinating so far to, to try and understand this concept. So I'd love it, Dean, if you could share a bit more about why the mind is divided, what's what's going on inside us that sets up this, this battle. Yeah, certainly. And look, the brain is really complicated. So the physical structure, that sort of two to three kilograms of, you know, sort of jelly that sat in our skull has got about 86 billion uh, brain cells within it. And each one has up to around about 10,000 connections which makes sort of like trillions and trillions of connections and it works on electrochemical energy. And you don't have to remember this, this, is, this will be in the exam at the end, but it's a really complicated structure. But when we look at it under functional magnetic resonance imaging machines, when we use things like uh, electroencephalograms where people wear these caps with all these wires going off, we get a general understanding about which part of the brain is doing the work at any particular time. So if we take some key players, we can say, well, when we're having a feeling about something, when we're working on emotion, then we see the blood flow going to the middle part of the brain. And that part of the brain, its agenda is basically to keep us alive. And that's why we have emotions. They drive our goals so that we, we tend to achieve them. And it basically has very strong instincts. And some of you may well have heard of the instincts like fight, flight and freeze. It has very powerful drives such as a food drive and a sex drive. And these are all basically linked to survival. And it also has very powerful thinking styles, just the way that part of the brain is set up. And when we have a look at that part of the brain that tends to develop first and is there about eight weeks before we are so what I mean by that is in the womb this part of the brain starts to develop um, so it's a very primitive part of the brain and we share it with the great apes so the orangutan the bonobos the chimpanzee and humans and gorillas have a very similar structure in this part of the brain and this is why we call it the inner chimp the chimp part of the brain so to recap, its agenda is survival. It has its own thinking styles and powerful drives and values. It's an independent thinking part of the brain. And that's why I said when the mind is divided and very often in conflict, it's in conflict with another part of the brain called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. It's sort of, you know, it's, uh, it's slightly higher above the eyes and at the front part of the brain. And that has its own agenda too. And if the chimp's agenda is to stay alive, well, this part of the brain is say, well, stay alive for what? What is it I wanna do with my life? You know, what's my purpose? So that's basically its agenda. And it works with facts, truths, and evidence. So it pieces you know, facts together and works logically. Whereas the chimp interprets the world using feelings and impressions. So we can see straight away that we have these two independent thinking systems. And whilst they can work together beautifully, and very often they do, well, very often they can also be in conflict. And then there's a third part, which we call the computer because it's very much like our storage system. So our memories, our beliefs, our assumptions, our expectations, our values are all stored somewhere. It's like our own Google, if you like. And so it's a storage area, but it also runs automatic programs. So basically, you know, we think about running a routine day, the way we brush our teeth, you know, how we greet people. These are all sort of routine programs. We're not stopping to think about how we run them, they just run them. But the computer doesn't think, it doesn't have an agenda like the other two. And the other two systems, the chimp and the human, can both program the computer. But just based on survival, the chimp brain gets first bite of the cherry. So it will always interpret 
anything that's going on, even now as we're talking to each other and other people are watching at home, depending on what's going around you, you're constantly surveying the environment, the threats and opportunities, who's behind you, you know, is there a door opening and your attentional system will move up and down. You might be quite relaxed. So your chimp will be thinking there's no threat here so I can relax. And that way you might be able to, you know, um, process some of the information with facts and evidence and piece it together logically using your human brain. So I, 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 I want to send everyone to sleep with that. <laughs> in a nutshell, that's the sort of, the, they're the three key players within the brain. I mean, it's far more complicated than that, but if we want to make it accessible and then use it, we can start talking in those terms now. So when I said confidence is a choice, so straight away we can see, well, is it a choice between the chimp circuits or the human circuits? or how we're programming our computer to run automatic programs. So when it comes to, um, you know, facing a challenge, taking a, a new challenge, not going for a job interview, for example, rather than having to sit and think logically and rationally, can we run these programs so that we don't have to think about how confident we are, we just get on and do it because we're programmed to be solution focused, face life and deal with consequences, because the chimp circuits find that very difficult. Super fascinating. I wonder if if we could just, I don't know if you have an example you could draw on, Dean, that might just illustrate that for, for people, whether it's a job interview or, you know, some, some kind of situation like that, where we might typically have a, a conflict within us about how we want to act and, you know, what we're actually experiencing and feeling. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I don't know, Christy, you, you know, um, when it comes to the language that we use to ourselves. So I don't know if anyone watching or listening has ever said to themselves things like my head says one thing, my heart says another, you know, and you think, hang on a minute, the, the heart doesn't actually talk. But so what are we talking about? And generally we're saying my head says one thing. So it's working on the facts and the logic. It's sort of when I know that there is a logical course of action but I feel like doing something else. And simply, you know, when it comes to, I'll, I'll use a very simple explanation because most people can sort of resonate with this and that's food, you know, where we go, we know logically and rationally that if we eat too much food, particularly certain types of food, we're gonna put weight on. We know that logically and rationally, but doesn't it make us feel better? <laughs> we just go, Oh, I just want to feel better in the moment. So if I'm feeling stressed or angry or upset, you know, I might reach for the biscuit tin. And, you know, that's it's, it's just the chimp circuits want to feel better in the moment. They're thinking short term. They're not thinking long term. And they just want to feel better or less worse. So when it comes to, you know, I mean, other language that we use to ourselves, I couldn't live with myself if I ever did that. And you think, well, you are yourself. So how would you live with that other thing that's there? And basically, again, it's the it's the a reflection of the mind being in conflict. Uh, on the one hand, I want to do this. And on the other hand, I want to do something else. And again, that's sometimes a reflection of how we feel about something and what we think logically about it. You know, mm -hmm. so when it comes to going for a job interview, you know, <laughs> I mean, even looking at the advert, first of all, there's going to be a part of the brain that says, Oh, do you know what? I'm looking at the, the qualifications, the experience, the prerequisites, the job description. I don't think I, I haven't got that. So therefore, I'm not I'm just going to pass it up. Well, we know when it comes to a job interview, look, if you've got 80 percent, around about 80, you know, they're going to look at you somehow. Uh, but it's this whole you now I'll tell you what, maybe next time when I've got more experience, more ability, more knowledge, more competencies, so the chimp might not be this, you know, outward expressive feeling thing. It might be steering you to a life of avoidance. Oh, do it next year. You know, you'll feel better about it then. But actually, it just wants to feel safe in the moment. I can see just from the chat that there's some people relating to, to some of these things you're describing. I imagine, you know, they're, yeah. they're feelings a lot of us can relate to. Well, it's, uh, it's really common. It's really common where... You know, I mean, it's not often clients come to me and say, I'm really happy, <laughs> you know, well, you know, and I, I want to feel less happy. It's usually because for some reason, the chimp is in charge 
And when we think about our lives and maybe the way that we've been brought up and some of the pressures that have been put on us, you know, it's the, our, our chimp, our chimp brain is essentially, you know, our genes, you know, hereditary characteristics, our biochemistry and how they re and how that reacts with the environment. You know, so when we're, when we're babies, we're very much chimp led. It's just the chimp brain that's there because the human circuits don't come online till around about the age of two or three years old. And, and I don't know if anyone's got any toddlers out there, but a, a real sort of like strong insight into the human brain coming online is when your children start asking, why? Why do I, why do I have to eat that green stuff? Why do I have to go to bed at that time? Because they're starting to process information slightly differently rather than, well, I feel wet, uncomfortable, hungry, so therefore I'll scream. And, that, and as we go into adult life, we still do that to a certain extent, but we're a bit cleverer. Our chimps are a bit cleverer about how we go around having our needs met. I find this all fascinating and it's it's a bit interesting because it's like the quote, you know, don't believe everything you hear. And now it's don't believe everything you think because you've got two things thinking in your head at the same time, potentially. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and that's really interesting because the chimp has a tendency to think in certain ways. And we know from research, it, you know, if I was to sort of try and categorize them. And again, I'm just trying to get a general principle across here. I just like to say you know, whoever's listening and watching, you're all unique. So you all, you know, have your own memories and values and ex expectations, etc. No one person is alike, but we do have certain tendencies. And the chimp thinking tendencies are that it thinks catastrophically. So when it comes to a, a job interview and you leave and you might have, you know, let's say you tripped up on your words a couple of times, straight away, the chimp is well, that's awful. They think you're terrible, you know, and you're never going to get that job. And, and it will just start, you know, catastrophizing whatever's going on at the time. Those, those of you in work now and, you know, someone says, oh, the boss wants to see you at five o'clock. And you think, oh, my God, what have I done wrong straight away? And the chimp starts going, you know, going back through the day, the week, the last 20 years about things it's done wrong. Uh, it also thinks in, you know, in sort of like paranoid way. Um, and paranoid thoughts, you know, the chimp has an ego. It's all about itself. And parent, you know, when you walk into a room and people stop talking, it's because they're talking about you, right? <laughs> you know, there's no evidence. It's just, well, they're talking about you. So, and, and the chimp thinks it's the center of the universe. And if all of our chimps thinks that it's at the center of the universe, nobody is. And other thinking styles, irrational. So if I drop my glove on the way to turning my laptop on, it means the technology is not going to work well tonight. Two pieces of information, not pieced together at all. Um, and it has emotive judgment. I don't know if anyone's just woken up and gone, I just feel like it's going to be a bad day today. I, I don't know what it is. And it's just going on that sort of emotion you're experiencing at the time. Whereas there is a choice to think, well, hang on, how do I want to think because the human has thinking tendencies and the human brain can think, um, you know, with shades of gray. So it knows the chimp will think black and white. You always do that. You never do that. It's, it's always going to be this way. And there's no in between. Whereas the human says, well, there's lots of in between and I can pick lots of different options. Uh, the human has perspective. So it doesn't catastrophize. It can just say, do you know what? The milk has been spilt what's the plan? Let's clean it up. You know, we don't have to blame anybody. We can, you know, evaluate what happened afterwards, but we have to be solution focused and, you know, generally logical and deduces information. So is there an easy way then to tell who's thinking, whether it's the chimp or the human thinking? Well, anything, uh, feelings, thoughts, behaviors that you enter into. And if you say, right, as you reflect, do I want this thought process? Do I want to feel this way? Do I want to act in this way? If the answer is no, then your chimp is in charge. And that's one simple way of going, well, I'm saying I don't want these thoughts, feelings and behaviors. And if you think, well, well, who are you? <laughs> you know, who's, who's this human brain? Because 
if our chimps have been in charge for so long and they've enjoyed, you know, trying to keep us safe, but generally short term, then when it comes to who you are, how about how about a little exercise for people to try? And I'll, I'll stop boring them for now with. But how about this? So uh, get yourselves a blank piece of paper, you know, and a pen or if you're writing on a tablet, whatever it is, you know, old fashioned pens and pencils. Mm -hmm. And if I ask you now to describe the ideal or perfect you, you at your very best, what would you write? I mean, even do it now, write it down. What qualities, what characteristics, what approach, you know, even what behaviors, what would I see you at your very best? And as I'm sort of talking, just, just keep writing them down. And I've no idea, you're all unique, so I've no idea what you're, you know, what you're going to write. But I've got a good idea what you won't write. <laughs> you won't write, well, I want to feel like a fraud. I want to feel underconfident. I want to feel like a failure. I want to be stressed. That's probably not on your list. And if it is, well, good luck with that. I can't really help you if that's the way you want to be. <laughs> but what I'm saying is there's a choice here. So you at your very best. And I want you to look at that list. And whatever you've wrote, that is the real you. The person that you want to be is the person that you really are. And I want you to think about this, you know, because afterwards when you're looking in the mirror and you say, but Dean, don't be stupid. You know, you're telling me, I'm telling you, I feel like a fraud. It's not you. It's not you. It's not you. And a question just get, what if you can not bring yourself to write anything? I don't know, I, you know, have a think about this, have a think about the question later on. Some things might not come to mind or even, you know, how would you want your best friend to be? What qualities, characteristics would you want in a best friend? Write them down because really they're a reflection of what's important to you. So that might work for those who didn't write anything down. But if you've got, you know, um, you know, honesty, uh, creativity, um, you know, ecology, wh whatever's on your list, I don't know, um, you know, trustworthiness, kindness, compassion, all those things that might be there. That's the real you. Whenever you're not any of those things, and this is really important, then the chimp is in charge. It's got the blood flow in the brain and the metabolic activity. So it's doing its thing, but there's you. And we might not have seen you yet. The world may never see you, but you've got to know that that is you. And when it comes to things like self-esteem and self-worth and self-confidence, that's who you really are. And the more work you do on yourself to help manage your mind, and it is a skill, by the way, it isn't just something that happens. You, you do have to work at it then the more likely you will come to the fore and the more likely you've got the platform from which to manage your chimp. And that's so important. I wish, I, I wish it were possible to see everyone on the call, you know, because I think everyone's probably sitting there with their pieces of paper and tablets or phones or whatever thinking, oh, yep, <laughs> there's a big discrepancy here between who we want to be and, and who we're actually being in practice. Yeah, and when, when it comes to, you know, well, what do you do with this information? You might say, so what, Dean? Well, I would encourage you every day to bring that alive somehow. I mean, I'm sure, you know, most people have a to-do list. You know, oh, I've, I've got to apply for this certain job. I've got to tinker with my CV. I've got to go and get some milk or whatever it might be. But how about having a to-be list? How about reminding yourself every day? Well, yes, this is what I've got in front of me but this is how I'm going to be. Brilliant. So I wanted to do, I feel like there's so much to talk about that we could spend hours here, but I wanted to share, if it's all right, Dean, one quote from the book, The Chimp Paradox. And then I'd love to just get into how, how people can manage their minds better yeah. now, now understanding sort of on a basic level what's going on. Um, but the, the quote I've, I wanted to share with everyone is the chimp is a very valuable individual trying hard to be accepted within the troop and impress the troop. 
Um, this is a permanent state and will never change. Typically the chimps will be very self-critical and lack confidence in its own abilities in order to eliminate errors or, or not show weaknesses. It will be intolerant of any shortcomings or mistakes. The chimp believes that others are constantly judging it and seeing its every fault. And I just, I wanted to share this because it seems like such a strong statement that I think most of us can probably relate to this, this feeling of always thinking about what other people are, how they're perceiving us and not how we want to be and be perceived. I, I wonder if you could just sort of speak to that really quickly, Dean, you know, what, what this yeah. urge to impress others. Yeah, certainly. It is. Well, when you think about the two circuits and how these circuits validate themselves. So how does the chimp know it's doing well? Well, it relies on external feedback. It relies on how much money it's making. It relies on its status, what job it's doing, what car it's driving, what jewelry it's wearing, what clothes are they, labels, etc. So it uses this information to validate itself to say, you're doing all right, you're doing well. And I'm not saying that's wrong or right. I'm just saying, how helpful is that? And is there an alternative? So still, if it's your dream to have a, a big house with a swimming pool and a lovely view over the mountains, etc., then let your chimp dream. Go for it, you know. But I'm saying that you have to manage that dream. It's your job to go, well, what are the short term goals here? And if I don't achieve that dream, does my world fall apart? And the alternative is to say, well, the human circuits, we can deliberately and intentionally choose the values that are important to us. So if those values are ecology and conservation and, uh, you know, and kindness and support, etc. Well, at the end of the day, if we didn't get that promotion, if we didn't get that job, we can look in the mirror and say, in my efforts, to get there, did I live by my values? And if you did, you can look at yourself in the mirror and say, well, I can sleep safe at night. And it, the chimp will always think like that. So when it comes to validating itself, and, and again, other people are really important for the chimp. You never see a lone chimp in the jungle, do you? <laughs> you know, it'll generally die or be attacked by another troop. And if you haven't got your own troop, so those of you who are listening and watching, if you haven't got your own troop, then I would suggest investing in one, you know, have a real think about who's got your back and how you invest in those who've got your back. Even now, you know, do you send them a text if it's the other side of the world and you email each other, you know, how are you doing? Just checking in on you. I'm, I appreciate, you know, our friendship. That's all. And it's just to keep those connections alive because they're really important for the chimp. Great. So basically, you know, when when people are looking at better managing their minds, now understanding this this chimp human conflict, there's always that choice between whether you go with the chimp or whether you go with the human. And on the human side, it's largely value based. You know, am I so you're measuring yourself against what you've decided is important. Is that right? Yeah, your own set of values. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask too, something that I found really interesting is sort of how expectations play into your sense of, of confidence. Um, and I think maybe everyone can relate to that, but I thought it was especially interesting in the conservation sector because our sector is notoriously difficult to break into. It's yeah. really hard to get that, you know, say you're graduating from university, really hard to get that first foot in the door that first job. Um, and so I think it's really easy to feel like it's a sector in which there's a lot of problems and there's a lot of barriers. Um, and it's really easy to, to feel kind of like a, a victim of that. Yeah. Um, is there another approach where you can have more realistic ex expectations um, and you can kind of set yourself up to, to, to succeed a bit better, if that makes sense? Yeah, it, it does. It makes perfect sense. And I think even as you're asking the question, it's I, I can hear, you know, when you're saying, you know, if there are high expectations and which generally the chimp has, because the way the chimp works is it will 
build a model of the world you know so as it leaves it, the door in, in the morning it will say well you know the transport should be on time i shouldn't get stuck in traffic people should be polite to me when i get to work or you know if i get to that job interview they should understand that i might be a little bit nervous all those expectations the chimp is thinking ahead because that's a survival mechanism but what it does which is unhelpful is it then actually measures and and sort of assesses its expectations with reality when you said what what's it really like and the bigger the difference between the two then the more potential for unhelpful um, emotions and thoughts and behaviors so you have to use the human to go well what are the truths of my life what what are the truths i have to accept and live with and by accept i don't mean just roll over and uh, you know and and let people walk all over you. I mean, what's life really like for you? So if I was to say, you know, if I was to live your life tomorrow, what do I have to expect? What are you gonna warn me about? You know, what time do I have to get up? And that way I can start planning around it. So I'm using the human brain to reassess expectations rather than being high or low. And again, if you want your chimp to have high and low expectations, fine, let it. But, you know, have an alternative and go, well, what's reasonable and what's realistic in my expectations? And reasonable even might be, well, my chimp thinks it's reasonable, but has it always been like this? And use evidence from reality. So you're using the facts and the truths from life. And if I can give a, a very quick example, I mean, I'm sure as a, if everyone's been to a restaurant and paid for food and because you're paying for food, do you expect a good service? You know, it's your hard earned money. And most people say, yeah, it's reasonable to expect a good service, but do you always get a good service? Not necessarily. And the more money that you pay, are you expecting a better service? Well, yeah, it's reasonable, but do, does that always happen? And the answer is probably, well, no. So based on the evidence, I need to work with reality so when anything happens in life, if you don't get that job, you know, if you don't get that promotion, if you don't break into the field, you can say, right, how do I move forward from this situation? So what are my plans? And manage your chimp, give it some TLC. You know, if it wants to shout and scream, let it shout and scream to somebody who understands what it's doing. So you're exercising it. But at the same time, you know what you're doing when you exercise it. And then it's like, right, what's my plan? I'm going to remain solution focused because this is the reality. This is what life is really like, warts and all. Brilliant. So I'm just conscious of time here and I want to make sure that everyone who's joined us today has a chance to ask questions because I see them. They're starting to add up here in the Q&A, which is great. Um, so maybe I'll just just end with one last question for now, which is, is there anything else you'd, you'd suggest or recommend people do or, or practice to, to get better at, at managing their mind and getting the most out of themselves? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'd like to challenge, you know, I'd like to challenge everyone to give their chimp a name. Um, <laughs> think of a name for your chimp. And I, it might sound a bit strange, but, you know, when we think about our language and you know, I, I don't want to hear you, you know, come to me and say, I am an angry person, I am a stressed person, I am an anxious person, if you don't want to be. So to try and put some separation between you and your chimp, you can say, right, you know, I don't know, bubbles my chimp or coconut my chimp, you know, is feeling stressed about something. And it gives you a chance to go, well, I wonder what it's feeling stressed about. What is it that I'm not doing? Or what is it trying to tell me? You know, what do we keep doing together that is perpetuating this stress? And it gives you, a, 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 you know, more of a platform to work with, you know, your chimp. So I would say definitely, you know, name your chimp. That's, that's certainly one challenge. I would, you know, certainly encourage you to keep, when you leave the house, well, your to-be list. How do I want to be today? And keep that in mind and use it almost as part of a warm-up. So if you're on your way to an interview, you know, you can then say, right, you know, are we ready? You know, chimp, I've got your back. Let me do the talking. 
right? And if you want to sound off afterwards, that's absolutely fine. But I'm in charge right now. So there are, there are a couple of little, little challenges. And then, I mean, one that's probably a little bit more difficult and will take more time. And I'd encourage people to do it over time. And that is to, be, to, to try and find out what might be in your computer that is prodding your chimp. Because the nature of the chimp won't necessarily change. So if you've got an insecure, an anxious, a hypervigilant chimp, a passive chimp, it's probably always going to be like that. But it, I wonder if there's anything in the computer that prods it and keeps those, those unhelpful emotions going. So essentially, are there any really unhelpful beliefs? I mean, we call them gremlins in the, in the model, but you know, are there any unhelpful beliefs and behaviors that are keeping that going? And that's a slightly longer term challenge. So I'm basically saying, tidy your computers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like virus uh, software in there. Uh, and again, that's the human's job. But that, that's, that's slightly more difficult. I love that analogy though of tidy up your computer. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, I, I'm going to stop there. Thanks so much, Dean. I'm going to hand it over now to, to everyone who's started sharing their questions. Um, so it looks like the upvoting is working perfectly. Um, so the question up first comes from Lynn uh, and it's, they say a man will look at a job app application, you know, with, 10 items. I think, I think this means 10 criteria. I'm thinking I can do that. Or sorry, I can do that, that, and that. Um, whereas a woman will look at it and be able to do all but one item, but rule herself out for that one thing. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> well, I don't want to be contentious here. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question to lead with. Yeah. Do you know what? Somebody will always bring the difference between male chimps and female <laughs> chimps. And and look, what I'd like to say is, first of all, chimps they're on us. We we are all on a spectrum, you know. So, you know, a male might have, you know, female tendencies in their chimp, and vice versa. And the, the latest neuroscience is basically saying that there's very, very little difference in the brain architecture between males and females. But there is a difference in the way that they might be, you know, parented, they might be gendered, et cetera, as they go through life. And, you know, the, the way that our genes interact with the environment and the way that we are parented and our caregivers and the way that, that you know, other people look at us in school, <laughs> you do see differences in female and male behavior as you do in male and female chimps. You know, let's, let's work with reality. We do see a difference, but it doesn't mean it has to be like that, you know? And I would say that's actually, you know, when we go, right, males will do this and look at 10 things and females will do this. Well, what's in your computer about that? Is that a limiting belief? So if you are a male or a female and that's what you believe and that belief is unhelpful, well, if a belief is something we've chosen to be true without the evidence, then, well, let's flip it. Let's choose something to believe and let's build the evidence around it. Because I would ask if anyone holds that belief, my question is, is that a helpful belief to have? What are the consequences for you of holding that belief? That's but the, the whole male female I mean it's a great question um and also if if that's the way well do you know what I sort of when it comes to males and females each has very very helpful skills and I would like to see you know both in in workplaces etc because they bring lots of different skills to the table that's great. <laughs> Thanks, Dean. Yeah, good, good, contentious, interesting question to start off with. But I, I like that, you know, it kind of comes back to something you said earlier, Dean, which is that there's always a choice. It's your choice. And, and there's an opportunity there to kind of self-reflect and, and see if this is a useful approach or, or belief. So I think that's great. Um, okay, next question. Uh, how would you free yourself if you found yourself totally under the control of the chimp brain? I never feel I have a human brain. Well, again, great question. Um, I just pick up the language. I never 
have a human brain. I'd like to, if we were sitting one to one, I'm sure there'd be instances where we could say, do you know what? Maybe if we looked at, you know, your 12th birthday or so, something like that, where we'd see maybe a bit of a, a human brain. Um, if you're in a chimp hijack, um, I would recommend having, so, I mean, first of all, give yourself some TLC, because if you're in a chimp hijack for whatever reason, it's, it's probably very, very difficult and very challenging. And your chimp is saying, please help me, please help me. And if you can somehow express what your chimp is feeling at the time. So you might not have anybody to express to. So I would suggest maybe writing it down, but the act of almost getting it outside can help you then process what it is that you're feeling, thinking and doing and maybe do something about it. Because when we have a, when we think about what do chimps need when they are in distress? Well, first of all, they need to express what it is that they're feeling. And secondly, they, they want some understanding and acknowledgement and maybe some recognition for what they're feeling as well. And that's why rather than if you came to me and said, oh, I'm in the chimp hijack, I'm really stressed and things are going wrong. If I feed you solutions straight away, your chimp brain's probably not gonna take, on, take those solutions on board. I have to somehow talk to your chimp. And when you think about working with other people who are in distress, and even think about, you know, working with animals in distress, it's giving them the opportunity to, you know, settle the chimp brain is almost to say, all right, there's no threat here. So, you know, I'm sorry to hear that you're going through that. It sounds like you're having a really hard time. And I don't want that to, to sound disingenuous, you know, but those type of words to a distressed chimp can somehow move the blood flow from the chimp brain to the human brain. And then the chimp, you know, will go, okay, I've, I've said what I need to say, or I've, I've got it out, I've written it down, I've journaled it, or I've, you know, art therapy, I've draw, drawn a picture of it, but it's out there. Okay, now I'm willing to do something about it. Because generally most people know what they need to do. It's just that the chimp's got all the, all the blood flow. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks everyone who's sort of sharing resources that they found found helpful and comments in the chat too. Um, yeah, so basically it's not it's not necessarily just recognizing that you've got this this chimp aspect to your brain and saying I'm going to ignore you and <laughs> leave yeah. you over here and go with a human. It, it's it's the two working together in a constructive way. Yeah, and it's like I said earlier. It's, I mean, look for some people suppressing the emotion and fighting it. It might work but the emotion has to come out at some point. And I think someone made a comment earlier. I, I caught sight of it quickly and it was a great comment. And it was almost like, well, we paint the ch chimp in a negative light. It's almost like the enemy, but actually it has some fantastic and helpful points. And, uh, you know, if you think about, well, if it's agenda is survival, well, it is your survival mechanism. It has drive, enthusiasm, humor, ambition, it's able to read, you know, nonverbal communications because it might be going underneath the conscious radar. So it has some skills and we can utilize those skills to help us get where we want to get. So there are some positive aspects of the chimp. So suppressing in general, we know from the research that suppressing emotions longer term can actually be unhealthy. Whereas when we express them, but we express them appropriately to somebody who's willing to listen and not judge what our chimps have to say, then that can be very helpful indeed. Great. I think that's super useful. Um, okay, so we're getting close to the time we need to wrap up, but I want to I want to get through a couple more questions here. Um, next one is, what are the best things that a chimp brings us that we can value it for? Very close to what you just touched on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, if you think um, I'll give you a scenario. <laughs> it, I mean, it's going to keep you alive, regardless of whatever happens in, it's going to try and keep you alive. And I was watching a video recently of a, a chap who decided to go hang gliding and um, he got so far, so far up and realized that he wasn't strapped in. 
so basically he was hanging onto a hang glider with the instructor and then hanging, I mean, I think the clip's on YouTube somewhere. And he was holding on to, um, I think like the salopettes of the instructor. And while he was holding on, I mean, if he dropped from that height, he would have definitely died. But while he was holding on for dear life, he evulsed his bicep tendon. So he actually ripped it off the bone, but still managed to hang on and hang on long enough so that the hang glider could get low enough and actually just let go after that. Um, sustained some minor injuries, but stayed alive. So you think that, well, how can I galvanize my chimp? You know, how can I use that? And sometimes the language we use with our chimp can help. So, you know, if it's down, just practicing and getting it as a skill, you know, when we're down there, you know, doing some exercise, even we can start saying, right, come on, let's go. We're going to go a little bit faster on the treadmill or we're going to do a few more press ups. And, and you're with me now, Chimp. Come on, because this is life and death. You can bring it on board. Um, so it's, it, wants, it wants to achieve. Think about chimps in the jungle. They want to get to the top of the tree so they have access to resources. And generally, that's going to make them live longer and pass on their genes. Um, so things like motivation for our chimps are really important, but it has to be tempered with commitment from the human because you don't want to start a task and go, well, I'm really motivated for this and I want it to finish, you know, and then an hour in and you go, oh, I don't feel like it anymore. So I'll give up. So I would suggest starting, starting with commitment and then you'll see motivation follow. They're real positive aspects of the chimp. Perfect. Thank you. Um... So let's take one or two more questions and then we'll wrap up. How should you balance being confident and applying for a big job and modest, realistic and applying for a more junior job? It can feel demoralizing to apply for a lower job as a way into the sector. Yeah, that, Sounds that's like a question awesome. we had recently on a, one of our calls actually, but you might have some insights into this team. Yeah, it's a tough one. And, and, I don't know the answer because that would be based on how you deal with the consequences. Now, I would just say, if your decisions are based on emotion, emotions help in decisions, but if they're purely based on emotion, then the consequences afterwards are gonna be difficult to deal with and probably longer lasting. Now, if, it, you know, if you're weighing up the options and it's like, well, I don't know if you are working and you have to take a lower job and, and the salary is lower, but it's a way in and it's it's a step towards your dream. Then what are the consequences of, of taking that job? Well, they might be positive because you're on the ladder. Whereas if you miss that opportunity and go for the, the higher and the bigger jobs, well, could that be more demoralizing by not getting them? And having rejection because the chimp doesn't work well with rejection so either way i would always encourage you to say right let's have a think of this through the eyes of my chimp what do you feel about this what are your thoughts right now let's have a look at the logic here let's have a look at the consequences because the chimp doesn't deal with them and if you can live with the consequences which generally humans do adult because we're adults um you know we get on with it and we say, right, well, I'll try for something else. And something else maybe in the middle might come up. It doesn't have to be high or low. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of factors that go into, into that one. Um, thank you very much. Okay, so I'm gonna ask, share one, one last question and then I'm afraid we're gonna have to wrap up for today. I know there's more questions here, but... Um, We'll share some resources also for people so you can go in and delve more in depth into, into all of this if you'd like. So last question, um, talking about the chimp reminds me of the ego. I had a personal development coach who also challenged me to name my ego to allow for separation between me and the inner voice who sometimes is, is hard on me and has unreasonable expectations, et cetera. Um, also to talk to my inner child more kindly because my ego doesn't always do so. Is the ego sort of like the chimp or are they different? A great question. Uh, and you will see, and you know, Professor Steve Peters, who's the originator of the model, and you know, I'm standing on the shoulder of that giant, he will say you'll see lots of different 
you know, either therapy, strategies, uh, models, etc., within, you know, or similarities between others in the chimp model. The way we approach the ego is we say the ego is one of the chimp's drives. So that sort of need to maintain a favorable, you know, view of itself and promote itself, etc., cetera, um, is part of the chimp's drive because if it thinks that, well, I'm the center of the universe, it's more likely to stay alive. It's more likely to pay attention to itself. So along with many other drives, we say the ego is part of the chimp's drives. And drives are, you know, these sort of like physical and biological needs that sometimes have a psychological overlay. And they're almost like hardwired into our brain. So that ego is nearly always there. Thanks. Good question. Okay, so I'm afraid we're going to have to, we'll stop there. Um, thank you everyone for all your questions. A huge thanks, Dean, for being here today with us and, and just giving us a, a wealth of insight into what's going on that we're not, I think it's safe to say we're not normally aware of. Um, and especially for sharing that with a community of, of people around the world who can hopefully use this to have a really positive impact in their careers. So that I think that's brilliant. Yeah. And it is, I, I would like to say thank you to everyone for, for listening. And, you know, look, because you're all unique, some of this you might just want to put in the bin. <laughs> you might just go, doesn't work and doesn't resonate. And I would say that's absolutely fine. If there was one thing and you think I'll run with that, then absolutely brilliant. Trial it, you know, bottle it, sleep with it, etc but try and make it a skill because that's important. Great. I think that's a good, good note to finish on. If, if people want to learn a bit more or get any resources, is there somewhere they can go? Well, you can visit our website, um, www.chimpmanagement.com. Um, we have a section of our website. Well, first of all, I mean, there's, there's background information on the model itself. But um, there's also what we call the troop. And it's like an online community that where the chimp model or parts of it has resonated. And Professor Steve Peters will do a, you know, a short video every month uh, on a different topic. This month, it's been elements of decision making. One of the chimp management mentors will then set you a challenge. It will be some kind of development time. And then there's a forum where you can just go and engage with the rest of uh, the chimp community, <laughs> the troop. And I, I have to say, uh, obviously I'm horrendously biased, <laughs> uh, but it's incredibly supportive. Um, it's non-judgmental and you will see all the other troop members. You know, if you've got an issue, if you've got a question or a challenge, you know, write it on there and you'll get, you'll get people responding. And, you know, like-minded individuals who will say, we're not right or wrong here, but perhaps have a go at this. Have you thought about this? Very, very supportive. That sounds that sounds great. And it's yeah. free, by the way. <laughs> it's not when uh, yeah, it's not money. It's a free <laughs> resource. <laughs> free is great. Yeah. Uh, well, Especially your time is never free, so. <laughs> yeah, I I just wanted to add too that having having read the the chimp paradox, I found it really fascinating to to delve in more into what's going on in the mind. Um, so I really, you know, if, if you're interested in doing some more reading on it, that, that book is, it might be one to consider. Um, so we'll, we'll obviously share the recording of this webinar on our website, like we normally do. We'll share those resources as well with it. Um, thanks to everyone who joined today. It's really great to have you here. I hope you found it useful um, and insightful. We run a webinar about once a month. So we've got our next one coming up should be around the end of May, beginning of June. Um, it's currently being planned, so I'm not gonna share the, the topic. I'll keep it secret for now and we'll let you guys know on the website and by email. Um, and in the meantime, if, if you need more resources, more general conservation resources, we've just published a bunch of free ultimate guides. So you can just go to the homepage, Conservation Careers, and you'll find them there. Um, happy Earth Day on Thursday and a huge thanks again to everyone. Thanks for being here, Dean. It's been it's been fantastic having you. No problem. Like, like I said, real pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Stay safe. Bye for now. Bye.